Hello, I'm Sean Lim and welcome to After 10. Korean pop culture may have blazed across the world, but academics are increasingly finding the Korean wave in their research. On today's After 10, we're joined by David Kang, the director of the Korea Studies Institute at USC, who's been at the forefront of this growing field. Stay with us. Thanks in part to the increased popularity of Korean cultural contents, including K-pop, the international community is paying more attention to Korea these days. And the world's interest in Korea has expanded to Korean studies, which covers issues ranging from Korean history and politics to its economy and society. Universities around the world have expanded Korean studies courses, and the research on Korea continues. The University of Southern California Korean Studies Institute is renowned throughout the world. It's pretty clear. We should be able to go over Students from all over the world are studying a variety of fields related to Korea, from its pending issues to its culture and history. David Kang, director of the USC Korean Studies Institute, has been taking a leading role in promoting Korean studies. From the Korea Project, which focuses on preparing for reunification, to a variety of research on different issues taking place in Korea, David Kang conducts in-depth studies on Korea. Meet David Kang in LA and hear more about the rising popularity of Korean studies around the world. Professor Kang, thank you so much for letting us interview outside your house here in Los Angeles. Delighted. Well, why was the USC Korea Studies Institute first established? In the mid-90s, USC got more uh, aware of both the Korean community right in LA and the fact that they had a house on the campus that the An Chang Ho, Dosan An Chang Ho family had lived in for about 30 years. And the community got together with USC. The house had been languishing and they brought it over uh, fixed it up and created a Korean Studies Institute. At the time there were only two Korean Studies professors and around 2005 they were able to open the house uh, with a small endowment. They fixed up the house. It's beautiful. People come by all the time uh, and that's when they really started uh, not only because of the historic value of the house, the proximity of the community and of course the growing uh, importance of and interest of Korea in the United States. And as a scholar in this field, why do you think it's very important that we do develop Korean studies? I understand that uh, your academic background was in IR, but it focused more on the European experience and that you got into the East Asian uh, region later on in your career. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the reasons that I am so uh, enthusiastic about uh, Korean studies is, in general, I think that we have had so much focus, for example, on the European experience. It's the air we breathe in America. We know it. We know about uh, European history and European, that's what we're made of. But the world is much wider than that. And that given that Korea is such an economic powerhouse, uh, the importance of Japan and China in the region and in the world, these are very important things for Americans to understand. And they're important for us to be able to understand on their own terms, right? So that we so that we deeply understand Korea, its culture, its experience, so that we can deal with East Asia better. I mean, it's actually not that easy to do. You don't just simply say, oh, I'm now going to go study this part of the world. And so I think a Korean Studies Institute is an important element of helping Americans become much more globalized. And one of your pivotal pieces in your, I guess we could say, debut on the big academic stage was uh, an article that basically said how academics were getting Asia wrong. What were they getting wrong and are they still getting it wrong today? Um, yeah, it was called getting Asia wrong. And here's the thing, right? When you, when you think in terms of international relations, what we take for granted as obvious ways the world works is essentially the Western European experience. And we've developed theories about it, which we think are universal, which we think apply everywhere, uh, and yet probably don't. And the most obvious way that that happens is in this idea of a balance of power. This term started out as an academic term. Uh, it was derived from the European experience, 
But now everybody knows this term. There's got to be a balance of power. Uh, and it works really well in Europe, because in Europe, you had a bunch of similarly sized states for 500 years vying very much for the slightest advantage. So a bunch of multipolar countries, you know, fighting, fighting, fighting. So yeah, it works fine. We tend to think that that European experience is universal. But I submit to you, if you had looked at East Asian historical experience, you would not have developed a theory of a balance of power because East Asia never had a balance of power uh, experience. You had, since basically, uh, you know, for 2,000 years, you had an enormous continent-sized China. Every now and then it had problems, but it was basically huge. And then you had a, a vibrant Korea, Japan, Vietnam, Mongols. You know, you had a massive central country and a bunch of small countries. You would not have developed the balance of power out of, a European, out of an Asian experience. Uh, and so I wrote an article saying, we think today East Asia is going to go into a balance of power uh, situation. But we still don't see that happen. Right? I mean, today, China is still so much bigger than any other country in the region. I mean, it's hard to imagine what a true balance of power experience would look like in East Asia. So where are scholars and academics getting Korea wrong today? And how are you trying to address that through your research and your work at the Institute? Yeah. You know, the biggest thing, well, there's a couple things. In terms of foreign relations or international relations, I think the biggest thing that we tend to miss uh, is that in the United States, I think there's still a presumption uh, that this Korea-Japan squabbling should just go away. They should realize that the real concern is China and that Korea and Japan need to, I've heard phrases like this, grow up, be more realistic, et cetera, et cetera. And I think what we miss is that Korea's relations with Japan are central to how Koreans view the world. And instead of trying to get Koreans to change how they view the world, I think we need to understand that Koreans really care about how the Japanese present themselves and deal with the rest of East Asia and their history. And I think that's often missed. And we think, oh, come on, get over it. And that's not gonna happen. So rather than trying to, you know, we should deal with Korea the way it is, not the way we wish it is, which is they should have our goals and our feelings. A lot of academics and policy makers in Korea do look to experts outside of Korea for mm -hmm. a new perspective. Yeah. On the other hand, what kind of new perspective do you think your institute does provide because you're not um, researching with the lens of being inside Korea? Yeah. You know what I think, what I like best about being where I am uh, I'm not in Washington, D.C. I'm not in Seoul. We're a private university, nonpartisan, in California. Right? This gives us an enormous perspective. Because if you get into Washington and you try too hard to be policy relevant, uh, you get caught up in the American policy debates. And if you get into Seoul, you get caught up in all of the kinds of politics and stuff that goes on in Seoul. So we have a wonderfully unique perspective in the place on the world that is probably the most direct link between both Korea and the United States. I mean, California is where Asia meets America. And so we have a totally different perspective on the world than either Seoul or Washington. So how popular is Korean studies these days? Uh, is there an uptick in the number of students that you see really wanting to uh, study the field? Yeah. Um, we have, I mean, I actually really like what we're doing at, at USC because Korean studies there is a, a wonderful way to um, sort of garner the students' interests and, and get them involved in both Korea and the United States. We introduced a minor degree in Korean studies uh, two years ago. So now students can minor in Korean studies. We're up from two to five faculty members. We're adding a sixth. Uh, sociology, literature, cinema, you know, Hollywood, right? International relations, history. Um, and what we see is that students are, many American students are interested. North Korean human rights, sometimes Hallyu, right? They've seen a K-pop girl group or something or some movie. Um, but it's a, it's a way to get them involved. And so we have over 200 students a year taking courses. And that's, uh, that number is like probably going to increase. It's, it's literally limited by the number of classes we can offer. Uh, so the more, the more classes we can offer, we'll have far more students taking it.
We ask students who major in Korean studies why it is important to learn more about Korea. Well, basically just learning more about the economy of Korea. Um, the other parts of Korea I'm not, I'm not particularly too interested in, but just because I'm an economics major, I wanted to learn how the economy in Korea, what we're talking about right now, is integrated with the U.S. Um, because I think it's really important. I think Korean people coming to America to study their economy and their culture um, has a really profound influence on um, their future and how they're going to be in the global economy. And we as Americans should also try to learn those things so we can discover the patterns with them as well. So what's the main focus of Korean studies these days? Okay, well in general I would say probably the, the two most uh, exciting fields are probably Korean literature and cinema, right? Sort of uh, understanding Korean movies and Hallyu, that's where a lot of the research is being done. Um, and then modern Korean history. There's been an explosion of research about Korea under the colonial era, colonial era in particular, right? Um, so you have research now looking at uh, Korean intellectuals under the Japanese, how did they navigate their lives and remain you know, true to themselves yet live with the regime, uh, what happened to these intellectuals after they moved on. Uh, and that's in Korean studies. International relations tends to not be considered sort of Korean studies. Within IR, of course, North Korea, it's always North Korea is interesting. And where do you get access to this data? Is it mainly the defector stories that have been coming out? Or? Well, some are. There are traders who go back and forth. There's far more access for just uh, uh, people to go in. Now, that doesn't mean you're getting, uh, you know, government documents, right? But to gain, you know, sort of as an anthropologist or a sociologist to see how people live, what they eat, what they're wearing, far more access now. Uh, data about the government is actually much more easily available, meaning who gets appointed, who doesn't, you know, who's getting, uh, what, the, what the size of the bureaucracy looks like. That data is actually uh, more available now. President Park Geun-hye's recent statement that unification will be a big bonanza for the two Koreas has made a lot of headlines from the beginning of the new year. In front of a global audience, the president has stressed her strong will for the unification of the Korean Peninsula. The government also unveiled a plan to launch a preparatory committee for unification on the Korean Peninsula. Earlier this year, President Park described unification as a grand jackpot. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your opinion on, on the potential for unification on the Korean Peninsula? The potential is it could happen tomorrow. It might happen for 50 years, right? Again, this is one of the things nobody knows. Would it be a grand jackpot? I tend to think yes, right? The short-term view is it'll cost a lot of money. The long-term rewards of unification, I think, are immense. I say this to my class, or every time I give a talk on North Korea, right? This is a tragedy, that the only place on the planet where the Cold War still exists, where these two countries are divided and nose to nose, right? It's a tragedy. Um, to get rid of that, to not have to worry about a massive region-wide war, you know, the destruction of Seoul, that's an enormous, enormous benefit. Uh, getting there will be the, will be the problem. But the end result is, you know, to have a unified Korea, again, awesome. What are some of the research questions that you're asking or investigating that deal with unification? Well, the biggest one is what I think is very interesting. Again, most people focus on the long term, uh, on the short term, which is, can we unify? How would we unify? You know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, my friend Victor Cha and I started a, a three-year research project 
where what we said is, we know that there are going to be inevitable problems after unification. How do you fix the public health system? How do you deal with refugees and internal migrants in North Korea? How do you fix the energy grid, agriculture, education? Right? We know these things are going to exist. And so we got together substantive experts, and everyone only uses the Germany example, East and West Germany. But East and West Germany isn't necessarily the best example. Why? East and West Germany were fairly close in terms of uh, wealth, and they never fought a bitter civil war. So we got experts on nation building or rebuilding or reconciliation uh, from places like uh, South Africa, who had to really figure out how to deal with justice in a bitterly divided country, with between, in that case, ethnically or black and white, uh, on how countries rebuilt health systems in, say, Ethiopia, how uh, they rebuilt uh, the former Yugoslavia. So we got experts from these areas to talk about transitional justice, public health. How did you deal with the problems in, in uh, Bosnia? And we paired them with North Korea experts to say, here's what we know about North Korea and really had these teams of people talking about functional issues. And the research is incredibly illuminating. Uh, and I'll give you, I'll give you one uh, example. Most demographers are people who work with refugees. will point out to you that in Africa, in Bosnia, you know, the fear of two million refugees in South Korea is probably unlikely. It's unrealistic. The key thing is people don't want to leave their homes. And they would say in Africa, you know, bullets going past their head, and people are like, it'll get better tomorrow. Unless it's extreme, extreme conditions, people are not going to leave. So the point in South Korea is, don't worry about building huge camps for two million refugees. The first thing you have to do, and sh planning should start now, is in case of a collapse, you get food over the border into North Korea, and then you won't have refugees. And it's just, you know, we've got real, real insights into how to deal with a collapsed uh, North Korea. So if there is a benchmark for the South Korean government and policymakers, you would actually recommend not necessarily focusing on the Germany example, but looking functionally yes. at different problems in And that's, and that's what we've done. Society. We've done all these different things, yeah. But in that case, that seems to uh, skew uh, the reunification model to one that is more of um, subsuming North Korea. Mm -hmm. Are there other models? There's no way North Korea is going to subsume South Korea, right? The other way, the only other way that it might occur, and this would be the ideal way in some cases, right, is that North Korea uh, doesn't collapse, but slowly reforms over the course of a generation. But that depends on North Korea making moves. I have not seen them making. So you think a federation could be the middle step towards a unification? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But again, I don't think it's realistic. I mean, right now, it's either continuation of division or at some point the regime collapses. And those are the two, that's where we're betting. You know, that's where most of us would think it happens, yeah. So in the past 20 years, what major impacts have your Institute made? Well, we have an internal focus, obviously, on teaching and doing research to USC students. And there, we're very proud of how much we've grown. But we view our mission, our, our, our little catchphrase is, explaining Korea to the world. And we take that very seriously. Obviously, we support research and scholarship and, and graduate programs. But we actively try and reach out. And so, among those ways that we try to be what a university should be, which is disseminating knowledge. Um, we're probably, uh, one of the things we're proudest of is uh, a K-12 teacher education program. We take teachers, uh, it's been going for 10 years now, and it's uh, called CAFE, Korea Academy for Educators. Uh, and since 2004, over 2,000 American teachers have come and spent a week in the summer to learn about Korea. And they've come from 30 different states, like Iowa, Minnesota, right? Uh, because they're either, they have st Korean students, or they're interested in Korea, or North Korea, or something like that. And there's not a lot of resources for K-12 educators N on no, Korea. No, right? Because in general, uh, if you're an American t school teacher in junior high somewhere, you know, you've got your regular textbook, uh, and then there's a little section on China and a little section on Japan, and there's almost nothing on Korea even if they've got some Korean kids in their class or they want to do something, you know, they want to do more than that. 
So we get about 100 teachers a year. They come for a week in the summer. And we teach them about history, culture, politics, Korean American. Uh, it's an amazing way to help Americans understand Korea better. And we're, we're extremely proud of that, that way that we try and reach out, right? Because they then go and teach a generation of American kids about, about Korea. So what are your other plans for the Institute in the near future? Yeah. Uh, we have a couple things that we're doing. One is, uh, in addition to our K-12 teacher education, we have a YouTube video series, which is the most watched video series about Korea in the world. Now, it's nothing like a regular, you know, pop star, right? But most Korean studies institutes put a camera in the back of the room and they film an academic talk. We only do two or three a year, and we try to get the best scholars who can speak to a general audience about a basic Korean issue, so Korean literature. Or we just had Susie Wu, who's a wonderful professor at Cal State Fullerton, talk about Korean Americans, past and present. And we have uh, uh, about 50 times as many views of our videos as the next Korean Studies video uh, series. And we're trying to expand that out, because what we find is people come to USC, they Google, they want to learn about Korean literature or Hollywood or cinema. And they'll come and they'll watch our videos, which is amazing. Right? And so, you have your cinema school at USC. Do they help you with the video? Well, they're professionally done. Here's yeah. the other They're professionally yeah. done with three cameras, uh, with lighting. I mean, we really say this is not just simply you giving a lecture. This is made for being put on the web. And it's another way that we're trying to be innovative to take scholarship and translate it to a wider audience. So, uh, you know, we got a, a number of things like that that we're really proud that we're doing to help, again, to link America and Korea. I mean, it sounds like propaganda, but it's true. I mean, that's what we do. We try and help Americans understand Korea. We try and link the two. Well, your uh, pivotal piece, why, you know, why we're getting Asia wrong, had a really catchy title. What would be the next title for your <laughs> next uh, really mind, mind-boggling lecture or article? Uh, well, I, I, I'm not, I haven't come up with a catchphrase yet, but I'm really interested in the intersection between religion and politics in Korea, right? Uh, it doesn't appear to me that religion plays as much. You can't think of a Buddhist vote, or a, you know, whereas you can think of a Catholic vote in America, or we all worried about whether Romney was a, a, a Mormon, right? I can't think that of a way that religion affects politics the same way in Korea. And I'm, that's the kind of research that I'm trying to do, is to think about, does religion work the same way in Korea as it does in America? If not, why? So um, you'll hear from me about that in a bit. Very intriguing, and thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you for coming out all this way. I appreciate sure. it. And that does it for us tonight on After 10. Join us again next time. We'll see you soon. Your comments on After 10. After 10 always welcomes viewers' opinions. Please leave your comments, great ideas, or suggestions by sending an email, leaving a message on our webpage, or through Twitter.